your reaction to the news? Um, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, there's jitters now surrounding Credit Suisse. I guess I'd love to hear from you. Maybe let's frame it up. What is your big picture reaction? What are some of the near term consequences or scenarios that you're thinking about? And also possibly some of the longer term consequences and scenarios that you're starting to ponder. Let's start there. Sure, Julia. And uh, yeah, a, a big picture, longer term, probably the most important aspect of this. And we can we can talk a lot about that. Um, the, the narrower window, kind of very short term, um, you know, say Silicon Valley Bank. OK, what did they do? Well, they did the every every banker since the Middle Ages has done made the same mistake. You borrow short, lend long. So they took in deposits, uh, you know, uh, 75 uh, well, I think 125 billion of deposits uh, broken into, I think, about 75 in the um, hold maturity and 40 or so in the uh, available for sale category. So, you know, over 100 billion dollars in deposits. Like, what do you do with the money? Uh, a lot of it was loaned to um, their clients, these tech startups, you know, mostly Silicon Valley, but not exclusively. There's a lot in a lot in Massachusetts, some internationally, et cetera. Um, but it was kind of like the other way around. Like, I'll make you the loan, but when I make you the loan, I want you to put it in my bank. So the, the two sides of the balance sheet, the loan is to the tech startup, but then they put the money in the bank. And so the depositor is also the tech startup, not exclusively. And these are not all startups, by the way. Some of these are, you know, Vox and uh, Roku and some of these are, you know, mature, successful companies. And they had, in some cases, you know, two, three, five billion dollars uh in in the bank and so so, th th so they used to play to their balance sheet but in addition to making loans that was only about half the portfolio the rest of it they put into government securities uh, u.s uh, u.s treasury securities and not just treasury securities but the long end 30-year bonds not exclusively but uh, heavy on 30-year bonds so you sit there and say well i'm paying my depositors one percent and the bonds yielding two percent and i can leverage it you know 30 to one or whatever the regulators allow because the bond is not uh, considered a risky asset. And the thing about a treasury bond, it's not risky in the credit sense, but it's extremely risky in the market sense. And that, so when we say risk, it's a bundle of risk. You know, you've got maturity, credit, uh, foreign exchange, uh, settlement risk, yeah, there's all kinds of risk. So they were just looking at the default risk, which you know, is close to zero, but um, but the market risk is huge and the longer the maturity the more volatile it is so they got all these bonds and they're making spreads and it's leveraged and the returns on equity are you know huge and they're partying i mean they're taking all this money and going on you know staff ski vacations and all this stuff and i've seen it all before on on wall street this is not a, a new story um but you say, well, what happens when interest rates go up well you know bond math 101 is you know if rates go up the value goes down Rates go down, the value goes up. It's a little counterintuitive, but it's it's really simple. Uh, the the value moves inversely to the rates. Well, March 2022, what happens? Jay Powell starts raising interest rates, and he kept going through eight meetings. They're up to uh, four and three quarters today. Another meeting coming up in about ten days. Uh, my uh, expectation, my forecast is going to raise another 25 basis points. And let's come back and talk about that because they're. The Fed's between a rock and a hard place, but we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So get it up to 5%. So the whole time rates are going up, what's happening to the bond portfolio at Silicon Valley Bank? It's going down in value. There are huge unrealized losses in the billions of dollars. So why wasn't the bank, you know, kind of out of business, you know, six months ago or a year ago? Well, the answer is they parked most of these bonds, not all of them, but, but uh, two thirds of them in something called hold to maturity or HTM account. And that means this is, you know, this is all legitimate accounting. That means you don't have to mark to market. You are exempt or ex you have an exception to the mark to market rule. So if you paid a hundred million for the bonds and it's only worth 80 million because interest rates went up, you carried on your balance sheet at a hundred million. You don't have to mark to market down to the 80. So you have a 20 billion, in my example, you have a 20 billion dollar um, unrealized loss, but you don't have to do anything about it because you don't mark to market. And so, um, like, so, you know, and hey, we'll hold them for 30 years and get paid off and mature and we get all our money back. What's the problem? Well, the problem is you're relying on the deposits staying where they are. And by the way, it's come to light that Silicon Valley Bank and their loan agreement said, when we lend you this money, you have to put it in Silicon Valley Bank and you may not put it in any other bank. I mean, one of the, one of the ways as a, as a depositor, 
one of the ways you diversify risk is, you know, take the money, put it in five banks, you know, a little more paperwork, but if one of these banks goes down, I've still got the other four, I'm, I'm good to go. But they, but the, the borrowers had to put it all in Silicon Valley Bank. So everybody's locked in to this party. Now, when, as soon as the depositors start taking money, and by the way, these deposits, these deposits started to flee long before, uh, you know, uh, before last Wednesday, uh, when that, this, uh, um, when, when all this happened, I guess it was the uh, uh, the, the 8th, uh, March the 8th, I think it was Thursday, March the 9th, uh, sorry, March the 8th, I think it was the Wednesday, March the 9th was the Thursday when the stock crashed 60%, and then the whole thing was taken over by the government on the 10th. But, um, but the deposits were fleeing long before that. So there was some leakage. Uh, you know, Moody's was saying, we're going to downgrade you, but that was not announced publicly. The mark-to-market losses were there, but that was not announced publicly. They brought in Goldman Sachs to try to raise capital. So they had they had a plan. So as the deposits are fleeing, now they have to sell the bonds to get the cash to pay the depositors. So that whole thing about don't mark to market, hold to maturity, you don't have to mark to market. Well, that's true if you're holding them. But the minute you have to sell it to pay off the depositors, you take the hit then and there. There's no more deferral of that hit. So they were having to do that. So Goldman Sachs said, okay, here's here's the plan. Uh, sell the bonds, um, sell some extra bonds, sell some additional bonds, reinvest them in higher yielding bonds. That'll satisfy Moody's. You'll still get a downgrade, but it won't be severe. And we'll raise $2.5 billion for you. So they were taking a $1.8 billion hit, and that had to be announced because they're a public company and they're regulated. But Goldman says, we'll go raise $2.5 billion. That'll fill the hole in the balance sheet, make you stable, et cetera. And they got a $500 million circle from General Atlantic. They were going to, it's a very large, prominent uh, um, Connecticut based uh, venture capital private equity fund. They were going to do $500 million. And then Goldman was working, the fund was trying to get the rest. What happened was, as soon as they announced the loss and Moody's did the downgrade, you should have been ready to close the deal right then, like the next day. It's like, okay, and by the way, here's the $2.5 billion. They didn't. And then, there's a lot of, um, you know, there's the market risk we described, but there's just a lot of gross incompetence at Silicon Valley Bank. They had, um, we're talking about risk management right now. They had a vacancy in the risk risk management officer. There was like six months or more. They, nobody nobody was in the position. They weren't thinking about it. And then at least, and there were some good lawyers, and you saw them in Cromwell, they represent Goldman Sachs. There was some good, uh, good lawyers involved, but um, Silicon Valley wasn't even ready to sign NDAs, like the, the potential investors were like, okay, we'll take a look, sign this NDA and uh, give us all your books and records. And by the way, this is hairy, so it's gonna take a couple of days. Why wasn't all that done you know, a week prior or longer? And why wasn't SVP able to get their lawyers to stay up all night and do the non-disclosure agreements? So they bungled it, they lost the opportunity. And then you know, Peter Thiel says, you know, get all your money out and other VCs. I'm not blaming Peter Thiel. That was actually a very smart thing to say. But then it was it was just over before Goldman could get the deal done. Government takes it over on Friday night. 